Good morning, church. It is good to see you. I would love for us to take 30 seconds, go around and say hello to someone you've not said hello to today. Introduce yourself to someone new. Uh, let's extend our, extend our friendships around so that we are meeting new people for just a couple seconds. gathered together to raise our voices to honor the Lord Jesus today. Here we go, all creatures of our God and King. All creatures of our God and King. I get to dancing, but I get excited when we get to honor our Savior, Jesus Christ, because not because of anything that we have done, but because of what he has done on our behalf. Amen.
Spirit conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior. This is what I believe. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Our judge and our defender. Our judge and our defender suffered and crucified. Forgiveness is in you. Descended into darkness, you rose in glorious light. Forever seated high. I believe. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that He will rise again. For I For those of you that have come in after we started, we want to welcome you. For those of you online, we want to welcome you. Thank you for joining us online today. Um, it is our pleasure to be able to honor and worship the Lord and raise our voices. So I just want to thank him today. God, as we raise our voices to, to worship you and to thank you, um, we know that there is nothing that can keep us from your love. We believe in you. We believe the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. We believe that we will rise again, those that are in you will rise again. And so we are thankful that you have changed us, that you've brought us to this place of new life. And because of that, we honor and we worship you. We lift up your name as a beautiful and a wonderful and a powerful name because of what you have done on the cross for our behalf. And we are grateful and we say thank you in your holy and precious name. Amen. Sing, what a beautiful name of Caleb. Thank you. 
Death could not hold you. so much for worshiping with us. You may be seated. Good morning, Harvest. What a beautiful name. What a powerful name is the name of Jesus. Amen. I'd like to uh, welcome all of you. I'm Alan Holman, and I've got a few things I'd like to uh, share with you this morning regarding Harvest. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to welcome all of our visitors this morning, and if you are a new visitor um, and you haven't checked in with us yet, we would encourage you to do that and invite you to text us or uh, today, or um, you can also receive a special introduction through that text at welcome at 559-245-6200. The other thing is we also have uh, friendship registers down every aisle, just if you would, just take a moment, let us know you're here. If you have any uh, prayer requests or praise items you'd like to share as well, we'd like you to take advantage of that too. Um, 
October potluck, everyone's favorite, hey, woo-hoo, <laughs> third Sunday of the month, just want to encourage you to, uh, to participate in that. This uh, October's theme is going to be pulled pork sandwiches and salads, my favorite. Sign Up Genius is available, and again, that goes out in our weekly email, so we would just like you to take a moment to fill that out, let us know if you're coming, and what you'd like to bring. Small groups, the cornerstone, is it not church? So excited that, that our small groups are once again meeting on a weekly basis. And again, um, it's never too late to join one of our small groups. Um, this uh, several weeks, this fall, we've been de- delving into uh, gospel-shaped outreach, which is, again, also very, very essential to our faith, is just to become better equipped on sharing, sharing the gospel with others. And again, that's the kind of culture we want to have at our church, is a gospel-shaped, centered church. So again, we would like to encourage you to do, to get involved with our small groups. Uh, Again, you can contact me um, if you need further information or after church. But again, we want to encourage you to become part of one of our small groups. Um, If you uh, have not been receiving an email, again, we want to encourage you to, um, to receive our weekly email. And again, you can get the weekly emails by emailing church at harvestfresno.org and you will be added to our list and if again if you have any questions uh, that you'd like to um, learn more about harvest you can also do that by emailing the church at harvestfresno.org okay i would like to just end with a, a, a verse this morning just to encourage you it's from lamentations 3 22 to 23 a familiar verse it says the steadfast love of the lord never ceases His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Let's pray. Father God, what an honor and privilege it is to come before you this morning. And as your verse says, Lord, it reminds us just how faithful you are, even when we're not faithful. Lord, we just honor you this morning. We just want to praise you. Holy, holy, holy is your name, a name that is above all names, Lord. You are the great I am. And we just thank you for this opportunity just to, just to worship you this morning, just to come before you, Lord, and know that we can lay all our burdens at your feet, for none are too great or none are too heavy, and it is in you, Lord, that we have rest. And I just want to pray for anyone this morning, Lord, that needs healing I pray, God, that you'd come alongside them, that you would pass your healing hand through them if they need physical healing, emotional healing, whatever it may be, Lord. You know what the needs are of this church this morning, and I pray, God, that your will be done. Lord, I just thank you for um, being able to hear your word this morning. I thank you for Pastor Ben, and I pray, God, that you would just uh, open our hearts, Lord, to your word this morning and what you have to say through Pastor this morning. I pray, God, that your word would truly... Uh, renew our minds, Lord. We want to be conformed into your son's image, and we pray, God, that that would happen, Lord. And we just, again, thank you for our time together. We just give you all the honor, glory, and praise. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Good morning, church. So good to be here with all of you, and for those online, we want to welcome you as well, uh, joining us to, uh, to worship the Lord. Um, we are doing something a little bit different uh, today. We are going to be starting into a new sermon series, the uh, Gospel of John, and we're going to do it not next week, but the following week. Next week, we have a very special guest, uh, our uh, missionary, uh, Gabriel uh, Kazanga from the Congo is here today, and he's going to be preaching next week. So very excited to hear from you, Pastor uh, Gabriel, and uh, thank you for your willingness to to serve, and uh, we're excited to hear uh, from you. So um, (coughs) this week is going to be um, a sermon uh, relating to our small group. Our small group is about evangelism. So I thought, in a way, to kind of support that, I will uh, preach uh, today on uh, evangelism and uh, the need for evangelism and how we could be equipped to evangelize. Let me just say a quick prayer. 
Heavenly Father, again, thank you for this time together with these brothers and sisters, and i um, so grateful for this opportunity to proclaim your name. And I t- pray, Lord, that you would um, just encourage all of us, Lord, to be uh, faithful uh, proclaimers of the excellencies of Jesus Christ uh, to a lost and dying world. And we pray for your divine enablement and equipping to be able to do uh, this task. And I pray that uh, we would all hear your words and your truth and apply those truths in our lives uh, for our good and your glory. In Jesus' name I pray this. Amen. Many of you have probably heard, because it made the national news, that Christians are declining. That is, the number of people who are professing to be Christians in the country, in the United States, is declining. And uh, it's been kind of a a drastic decline uh, recently, and uh, so much so that these, um, from Pew Research, they said by 2070 that less than half the country will be proclaiming Christians. And so currently, well, actually 46%. Right now, uh, 64% of the um, population proclaim to be Christians. And so there's going to be this significant drop. And people have trying to determine what, why is this happening? And what are they going to? Are they going from Christianity to another religion? And it turns out they're not. Uh, They're just considering themselves not religious. They they may consider themselves spiritual, but really not subscribing to any uh, particular denomination or religious uh, organization. And they're kind of just going to the mark where you say religious affiliation, none. And so they wonder what, what's happened here. And so some people have uh, theorized that, well, it's because churches have become so liberal. And if you're willing to uh, just accept anyone uh, and anything and not call out sin, then how does that differ from the world? And if it doesn't differ from the world, then what incentive is there for someone to just go to church? And then on the other hand, that's the criticism to the left, and then the criticism on the right is because of Christian nationalism and the people who profess to be Christians, and, and look what's happening in this country as a result of it. So they, they blame the right. Uh, the truth of the matter is, there's been a secularization of, of the United States going on for a long time. In fact, uh, the, probably the most pernicious um, import that we get is atheism. And that's coming from the universities. That's coming from Cambridge. It's coming from Oxford. And it infiltrates our universities. And that's what's being taught. So it's really no wonder that this is taking place. And so we're seeing this drastic decline. And yet, you kind of just wonder, how does that square with what happened 2,000 years ago and the rise of Christianity? is there any power in the God or not? And couldn't this trend kind of be reversed? What is it going to take to reverse this trend? Well, we have to go back a little bit, 2,000 years, and kind of look at the source. Where did the church take off in the book of Acts? And so we're going to look today, in the very beginning of Acts, to see if there's any lessons that we can learn and we could apply in our lives today to evangelize and to reverse that trend. Because it's not, it's, you think about it, 12, 12 people ultimately changed the world. And we're a whole lot more than 12. So the possibilities are really endless. So let's take a look at Acts chapter 1. It says, In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up. And after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen, he presented himself alive to them after suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, 
which, he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but, I, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So from this passage, we are going to look at four keys for effective evangelism. Four keys for effective evangelism. Now, you have to realize that Luke basically wrote a two-volume set, the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts. And the both were addressed to Theophilus. And many people have speculated and wondered, uh, who is this person? The, the actual name means lover of God. But we can't think that this is actually a lover of the one true God because pagans were given that name as well. But what many have speculated is that this person, because he's called most excellent Theophilus, perhaps he was a, a government official, and some have speculated that he's the person who Luke is appealing to to release Paul from prison. So he wrote a two-volume set to show that this is not a cult. This is not something so strange. This is a legitimate reality. And so perhaps he wrote it for those reasons we actually do not know. But he writes, and in verse 1, but both books, both books are concerned with the personal work of Jesus Christ very, very clearly. And uh, verse 1 says, and I have dealt with all that Jesus began to teach and, <coughs> and until this day when he was taken up, the commands through um, the Holy Spirit and the Apostles. So the first point that we're going to look at is that for effective evangelism, we have to present the person and work of, of Christ. That we have to present the person and work of Christ. And that verse 1, he says, from the very beginning, I've uh, dealt with all that Jesus began to uh, do and teach. And he talks about these commands. What, what, what commands? Well, to understand the commands you have to go back to the first volume. In Luke chapter 24, verses um, 44 to 48, we have to understand this is, uh, Luke alone uh, has this recording of the time that Jesus resurrected to the point that he ascended. And this is where he writes. So these are the, the this is the last basic message that he gives the, the apostles before he ascended. And in Luke 24, he says, Then he said to them, These are the words that I spoke to you while I was with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem, you are witnesses of these things. So the command is really the mission that the apostles are called to lead. The, the command represents the, the proclamation of the gospel, that they are his witnesses. So th that is the command, the, the, the preaching of forgiveness through Jesus Christ to the world. So to be able to do that, you have to have an accurate understanding of the person and work of Jesus Christ. This knowledge is foundational, having the spiritual power to be able to proclaim the gospel. And the message, the gospel, of how Luke frames it, it's not uh, an argument. It, it's not what someone does for God. It's what God did for you. That's the, that's the message. We're not trying to argue the way into uh, the kingdom. It's a proclamation of, of divine truth. Two things. Christ suffered, meaning he died, and he rose. So being an effective witness means we tell people that Christ 
lived and died and then rose again. But what's important for evangelism is why did he die? Why did he have to die? We need to tell people uh, not just about living a good life. Uh, Modern day evangelism deals with appealing to felt needs that people are lonely or they're um, in suffering or distraught and for whatever reason that Jesus is the answer. Well, he does heal on many, many levels, and that is true, but that's not why he died. He, he didn't die if you're single that you could get married. He, he died for sin. So it's important that we, we went through, the, we just went, spent the year in the book of Exodus. And in Exodus, what did we learn? There was a need for sacrifices. Sure, there was a lot of talk about how, you know, how to live a, a godly life. We looked at the Ten Commandments and things like that. But at the end, we saw the need for sacrifices, that you cannot approach God without a sacrifice. Hebrews 9.22, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Blood has to be shed. Why? Because no one could be good enough to get into heaven. And the biggest thing that you're going to hear, and we talked about this in our group, when you go out to evangelize, you're going to hear from 90 of the people probably, that if they think they're going to go to heaven, the reason why they're going to go to heaven is because they're pretty good. Or good enough. They're, they're not perfect, but God knows my heart. He knows I'm trying. He knows I have good motives. So that he's going to, at the end of the day, Give me a pass, and I'm going to go to heaven. It it comes in all sorts of forms, but that's the main reason why people think that they're going to go to heaven. Well, then why did Jesus die? You see, he had to die. He had to die because of sin. And the wages of sin is what? It's death. Eternal death. Right? That's Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And if there was a judge, right, and someone committed a crime and was guilty, and he just said, oh, and the person said, you know what, I'm, I'm pretty good. And you know what, I'm going to even try harder. We don't expect a judge to say, oh, I'm so glad to hear that. Have a great day. You're released. You're free. Right? There, there, there's got to be a penalty for, for the crime. And so it is for us. There has to be a penalty for our sin. One sin is an eternal offense against God because God is infinitely holy. So it's constantly offending him. So there has to be an atonement that has infinite worth. And so... We have to explain that Jesus had to die. He had to die on the cross. There is no no alternative. That justice had to be paid. Either you're going to pay for your your sins and crimes or Jesus. And the good news is that Jesus bore our sins if we put our faith and trust in him. But we have to explain that. We have to tell people that, yes, you're sinners and the wages of sin is death. You might be better than your neighbor, but God's standard is not pretty good. God's standard, he doesn't put on a curve. His standard is absolute perfection, Matthew 5, 48. Be perfect as my heavenly Father is perfect. That is his standard. And unless you are absolutely perfect, that you didn't sin, and even James says if you've sinned at one time that you're guilty of all, then you don't make it. You're not good enough. Good enough is absolute perfection. And we're not. So Jesus had to live a perfect sinless life in our place and then die on the cross for us. And so 
for us to proclaim the gospel, we have to show that he um, suffered. He had to suffer. He had to die. And this is something that <clears throat> that is just essential to the gospel. And then, well, the other thing that we have to do to be very clear about this is that <coughs> we have to provide proof that Jesus is alive. Well, how do you provide proof that Jesus is alive? Well, let's, let's look here in verses 2 and 3b. I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day that he was taken up. And after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles, which he had chosen, verse 3, he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs appearing to them for 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. So the first thing that we have to do is present the person and work of Jesus Christ. We have to show the, that he was God, fully God, fully man, that he had to die. And <clears throat> again, it had to be God because he had to have that death, had to have the infinite worth, and he had to be man because he actually had to die. He actually had to shed his blood and live that perfect sinless life. So Jesus, the God-man, had to live and die. And then secondly, we need to provide proofs that Jesus is alive. Now, convincing someone um, that Jesus is alive may seem like that's, that's almost impossible. Well, it's not. To the apostles, Jesus did appear. He, he appeared to them during that 40-day period of time, 40 day period of time and, and we see that, and we, we know that. But we have to understand what happened. The apostles believe he actually died. Their, the record shows that um, they, they saw him die on the cross. They, they, they heard the, the clank of the hammers against the nails that were driven through his hands and his feet. They saw a dead body be put into a tomb. They were convinced that he was dead, so much so that they cowered and they, they scattered and hid for their lives. Because they thought, if they did that to him and we're a follower, then we're next. So something had to happen for them to change and be willing to risk their lives to proclaim that Jesus is alive. And that is that he did appear to them. To them 11 times uh, that is recorded after the resurrection. He appeared to 500 people at one time from 1 Corinthians. <coughs> he showed them a crucif the, the wounds from the crucif his crucifixion. He ate and he drank with them. <coughs> he did that to show them that he is indeed alive. Now, that enabled them and emboldened them to preach the gospel message. To proclaim the gospel, to advance the kingdom of God. And <coughs> they asked him, uh, Jesus was, was still living, working and acting. Uh, they asked him about uh, speaking about the kingdom of God. Luke reveals that he was speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Why? Because when the Messiah died, they thought that kingdom was over. And when, when he was alive, they thought, okay, now he's going to usher in the kingdom on earth. The, the, the Messiah, the, the expanding the borders of Israel and bringing peace. And so he's alive and now he's able to do this. But no, it's a different kingdom. And the kingdom that he was proclaiming, he says, it's not, it's not for me to tell you when that when kingdom of God is coming, meaning the, the earthly kingdom, because he's proclaiming a different kingdom. And we are proclaiming a kingdom, a heavenly kingdom, a spiritual kingdom. And so this transformation took place with the apostles where they, their lives were absolutely transformed his death, and many did proclaim the gospel message. And <clears throat> as a result of that, many people were saved. They were, they were commissioned and, uh, and equipped and, and taught to preach 
the message. Okay, well, that's the apostles. What about us? What are our convincing proofs? You see, we need convincing proofs for us to be bold in the message, but the person that we are talking to, who we're we're, uh, uh, sharing the gospel with, also has to be convinced that Jesus is alive. So we know that no one can say that Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. At the end of the day, it's the Holy Spirit. Agree that Jesus is Savior, Savior, Lord, and alive. We can't convince someone of that truth. However, we have a responsibility to show that Jesus is alive by a transformed life. Because people need to see tangible evidence. Okay, they hear it. What difference does it make? What, what, why, why, should I, why should I die to myself, give up the things that I enjoy doing, and for, and for what? Why? You're saying this, Jesus, is something that I would, should give up my life for, then, but why? What, what benefit is there for me? Oh, you know, this pie in the sky, belief that I'm going to go to heaven, but what proof is there? Your life is proof. A transformed life is proof that Jesus is alive. Robert McShane, 19th century pastor in Scotland, said, Do not forget the culture of the inner man. I mean the heart. How diligently the cavalry officer keeps his saber clean and sharp. Every stain he rubs off with the greatest care. Remember, you are God's sword. His instrument, a a chosen vessel unto him to bear his name, in great measure according to the purity and perfections of the instrument, will be the success. It is not great talents that God blesses so much as the likeness of Christ. A holy minister is an awful weapon in the hand of God. The convincing proof is living a transformed life in Christ's love characterized by the fruit of the Holy Spirit, exhibiting love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control in your life. When people see that, they are stunned by it. Instead of returning evil for evil, that you return grace and love. Instead, that just shocks people. That stops people in their tracks. So what is going on? How could you do that? He offended you. You were wrong. Get back at that person. You have the evidence. You you can bury him. And showing forgiveness and kindness and mercy and grace in those situations. That's showing that Christ is alive. You all are the living proof that Christ is alive. So we have to present the person work of Jesus Christ, and then we have to demonstrate the truth that Jesus is alive. And thirdly, we have to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit. You have to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Verse 4. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And in verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. So the apostles had received the message. They had been taught. They lived with Christ. They knew about Christ, his death, his his burial, his resurrection. They knew all those things. They'd been commissioned. At this point, the apostles might have been, especially Peter, said, All right, at it. Let me go. I've been commissioned. I know the truth. What did Jesus say? Not so fast, Skippy. Hang on. Hold on. I want you to hang out in Jerusalem a bit longer because we have something that we need to give to you. It was the Holy Spirit. 
They had to wait. They had to wait for the Holy Spirit. See, it does, it's not enough to just have head knowledge. It, it, it's not enough just to be willing. We have to go out in the empowerment of God, otherwise nothing is going to work. How many times have you thought that you've got, you've got your ducks in a row, you are ready? It happens. Everything just gets fumbled. It's because we're doing it on our own strength. We're not doing it in God's power. You see, we need His power to accompany His truth. This is divine enablement. And he said, uh, but wait for the promise of the Father, which you heard from me. You see, they're going to be baptized by the Holy Spirit not in so many days. That's the bridge of the old and the new. That's the transition from the old covenant to the new covenant. And for us today, we have been bad. When you, when you accept Christ, when, when you've been regenerated, when you have a new life in Christ, you are baptized in the Holy Spirit. It happens once. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 to 13, it says, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body through many are one body, so it is with Christ. For it is one spirit. We were all baptized into one body. Jews, Greeks, slaves are free. We were all made to drink of one spirit. So, the Holy Spirit takes permanent residency in a believer upon faith. There's no such thing as a true Christian who does not have the Holy Spirit. You, you can't be a Christian without the Holy Spirit. And baptism isn't a, a special uh, procedure and uh, evidence by uh, the speaking of tongues or anything else. Every believer is baptized into the Holy Spirit one time. There isn't a need for the second baptism of the Holy Spirit or anything else like that. There's one baptism that we have, and we're received, that we receive it upon belief. So the disciples were waiting for this. They, they were waiting for this power to come upon them. And that word for power is where we get the word dynamite. It was the power. He, Jesus didn't want him to go out without that power. He, he told him to hold on. And this was the power to witness and evangelize. And he talks about this, uh, but receiving that power from the Holy Spirit. And that was the Spirit was giving them the gifts and the uh, ability, the power to serve and, and to proclaim the gospel. And so uh, we all receive that power that, that upon belief. But there's things that we could do to squelch the power, to hinder the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. We are told that we could grieve the Holy Spirit through sin. And we are called to continually be filled with the Holy Spirit. And the, the filling of the, of the Holy Spirit and to walk in the Spirit. Those are commands. Well, then, how, how has that happened? Well, you, you've heard me say this many times. It's not how much of, of the Holy Spirit you have, but how much of you does the Holy Spirit have? How yielded are you to God? How yielded are you to the will of God? How submitted are you to the, to the commands of God? That's how we are filled with the Holy Spirit. When we just have our say, I am yours, Lord. Do with me whatever you want. Wherever you want me to serve, I'm willing to serve. Have your way with me, Lord. I know this is, you, you've called me to, to forgive. I don't want to forgive, but, but by faith, I'm going to forgive. You call me to love someone who's absolutely unlovable and from, from, from my human perspective, but you've called me. You've commanded me to love, so I'm going to show person when I don't feel like it. You're filled with the Holy Spirit. And so that's how we, that's how we receive it, and we rely on the Holy Spirit. And I don't want us to miss something that 
this comes also through prayer. I want you to look at Acts. We're going to jump ahead a little bit. In Acts chapter 1, verse 12, <clears throat> it says, Then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, on a Sabbath day journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying with Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, uh, <coughs> Simon, the zealot, and Judas, the son of James. All of these were one accord, devoting themselves to prayer together with the woman and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. So <coughs> they were told to wait. They were, they were told to wait to Jerusalem. So they go to Jerusalem, and what do they do? They're just not sitting there with their arms folded and legs crossed, and they're praying. And you have to think about the praying. There, there, there's unity in their prayer. And they all had blemishes on them. Peter did not just denied the Lord. Thomas doubted the Lord. James and John were always wrangling over who was the greatest in the kingdom. Jesus' brothers didn't, <coughs> there's evidence that, that not only did they not believe Jesus was the Messiah, but they wanted to cause bodily harm to him. And all of these people, rich, poor, different p political beliefs, were together unified in prayer. Together. And they were told to wait. Do you notice? They weren't told how long they're going to wait. They were being obedient, willing to do whatever God told them to do. He said, go to Jerusalem and wait for the power of the Holy Spirit to come on you. And they did, and they're praying for the Holy Spirit to come, to be empowered, to evangelize. It turns out this was a 10-day event. But we see the power that came from the Holy Spirit, was the, resu the result was Pentecost took place through this prayer. Mass conversions took place through this prayer. And so for us to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to do the, the, the job that God has called us to do is not in our own strength, it's relying on the Holy Spirit to work and through prayer. And that's what's going to give us that, that empowerment. With one accord, they were able to do this. To be spiritually equipped, empowered, and emboldened to proclaim the gospel was through the power of the Holy Spirit. And then finally... We have to follow God's plan for evangelism. We have to follow God's plan for evangelism. Verse 6. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father had fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Samaria, to the end of the earth. So... <clears throat> Christ was continuing to, to teach his apostles uh, during the period from the resurrection to his ascension. And again, they were asking him about that kingdom, which was completely understandable. But <clears throat> what Jesus ultimately uh, does is he tells them that they need to go out and ultimately be his witnesses in all of these areas. So you kind of have to think about this. He's saying, here's the plan. You're, you're going to wait for the, for the Holy Spirit. We're going to wait for the power. And then you're going to go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and all the ends of the earth. <laughs> Imagine Jesus is ascending. And they say, you want me to do what? Yeah. You want me to do They've never been out of a 50-mile area radius of their life, and now Jesus is telling them that they're going to proclaim the gospel to all of Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and all of the ends of the earth. You know how big the earth is? And Jesus says, yeah. Have a good time. I'll be with you. That was the plan. The plan was for believers to be equipped by the Holy Spirit, to have the truth, to be equipped by the Holy Spirit, and then be faithful in the proclamation. 
This is God's plan for evangelism. And if we look closely, we see that you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all of Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. The witnesses are those who tell people about Jesus. And it's the word where we get actually a martyr from. And as church historians have said, the, uh, the blood of the, of the martyrs was the seed of the church. It grew as a result of that. But look at, look at the plan. This should inform the plan of evangelism for us. First, the first priority is Jerusalem. What is Jerusalem for us? Fresno. Our community. The number one priority, if you look at this in terms of priority, the first thing that we're supposed to do is evangelize Jerusalem. Our Jerusalem. Our community have an impact in our community. Then he talks about Judea going out further, just outside of our community. Then he talks Samaria. That's, that's cross-cultural ministry and the ends of the earth. But in terms of priority, in terms of time, in terms of finances, in terms of what's, what's going to have the greatest impact, this is the priority. This is the plan. And so, in Acts 1 to 7, it talks about the gospel in Jerusalem. In 8 to 12, it talks about beyond into Judea and Samaria. And 13 to 28, it's the gospel to the Gentiles around the world. But this is a plan. This is a strategy that God has given us. And he's provided everything that we need. He's given us the truth. Not an argument. Spiritual truth about who Jesus is. He's given us the power through the Holy Spirit. You could say, well, this is, um, I'm really not, that's not my calling. It is. God, God called everyone to do this. God called everyone. Go therefore, make disciples, all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded. It's all of our responsibility. And you could say, well, it's, it's, I don't have the ability to do it. But we know, right, that you could say it's not my gift. Well, he's given us the call, but he's also given us the ability to do it. Yes, there's people who are very good at it. There's people who have a special ability, but the, he's called everyone to do it, and everyone can do it. And you say, well, uh, I'm not just good at talking to people. I, I witness with my life. Well, yeah, we should have a transformed life. But how is someone supposed to know unless they hear? Do you listen to the news with the sound off? No. W we, we, need, we need word. It has to be proclaimed. Well, it's It's awkward telling people, what, what are they going to think? Well, the apostles told them at great risk. T tell that to Stephen, who was stoned to death, that it's awkward for you. We have to put this in perspective. We live in an area, in a country, where we could proclaim the good news of the gospel without repercussions. He, yes, people might uh, be estranged from us, but we're not going to suffer the way that people are suffering even to this day around the world in the Sudan and all sorts of areas. And uh, perhaps Stephen uh, Gabriel could tell us more about that next week, about what the suffering that occurs from proclaiming the faith. There's something that society need. We're, we're seeing a decline in Christianity. And the Holy Spirit can change that. We could change that. There's a, <coughs> there's a story by, well not a story, but Tim Keller was talking about a revival that took place in northern England. Excuse me, Ireland. And <coughs> there were uh, prostitutes that were getting converted. 
And the reason why they were uh, getting converted was very interesting. They said that people were not interested in their services, so that's one, business was down. But people who had been rude to them, who had marginalized them, were kind to them. They hadn't seen that before. It was the way that people were treating them that caused them to come to faith. And this reminds me just of a situation that happened to me over five years ago. I was actually looking for a church building at this time and parking in the parking lot. And a woman came up to me uh, when I got out of the car and offered to perform a sexual act. And startled and kind of like, you know, running away. But what she said next just almost stopped me in my tracks. She looked absolutely astonished that I didn't want to. And she said, why not? Why not? Uh, and to me, that was a fascinating question because what it means is that that was unusual. That response, she, she was shocked by that response, and she just can't figure out, why wouldn't I? Now, I was too flustered and afraid. I, I mean, I was, you know, f fleeing. But in a perfect world, that's an opportunity to share the gospel. And to have that influence affect her life in such a way, never got an opportunity to do that. But that's how we change the culture. It's not through legislating morality. Prostitution is wrong. It's a crime, and yet it happens. All sorts of things are, are crimes, but they happen. The way that we change society, the way that we change morality is through the gospel and people seeing changed lives. Let's change that decline. Let's show Pew report research that they're going to be wrong in 2070, starting with us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we <coughs> thank you for your words. We thank you that you have given us everything that we, that we need. You've given us the truth of who your son is. God who came down into earth as man, who lived a perfect sinless life in our place, who died, was buried, and rose on the third day and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father as Lord. We thank you for that truth. But we also thank you for the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the divine enablement that gives us the ability, the power to proclaim your truth and knowing that people say Jesus is Lord because of you. And you've just chosen us to be ambassadors, to be faithful proclaimers of the excellencies of your son. So I pray that we would all be emboldened and encouraged to proclaim the, the truth of the gospel and share the, the love of Christ to a lost and dying world who needs to hear the message of life the words of life. I pray that you would use us and use our lives to, to exemplify the mercy, the grace, the love, and, and be filled with the Holy Spirit and show the fruit of the Holy Spirit in lives and people would, would wonder why we are the way we are and we could have that opportunity to share the gospel. And I pray, Lord, if there's someone today who has not put their faith and trust in you, that today would be the day of salvation, today would be the day where they can proclaim that Jesus is Lord of their lives, and I pray that if, um, that you would just do a mighty work, that the, uh, they would no longer resist the Holy Spirit working on them, and, and that they would submit and surrender their lives to you. Lord, again, we thank you for all you do, and, and we realize that we can't do anything, but through you we could do all things. Through Jesus we can do everything. In Jesus' name we pray this, amen. Can he breathe into the dust? Can he make suns out of us?
Life is in His mighty hands. Life is in all mighty hands. He can do it. Yes, He can. He will prove it. Our God can. No one else can save us, redeem us, create a new life in us. Only Jesus can. Can he love his enemies? Can he make them family? Life is in his mighty hands. Life is in all mighty hands. He can do it. Yes, he can. He will prove it. Our God can. No one else can save us, redeem us, create a new life in us. Only Jesus can. Can he heal the leper's lamb? Can he heal the leper's lamb? Can he cleanse us? from within can we drink from living streams can we ever be redeemed he has healed the leper's limb he has cleansed us from within we have drunk from living streams Yes, he can. He will prove it. Our God can. No one else can save us, redeem us, create a new life in us. Only Jesus. He can. He can do it. Yes, he can. He will prove it. Our God can. No one else can save us, redeem us, create a new life in us. Only Jesus can. Only Jesus can. Only Jesus can. Faith and trust in Jesus. We would love to talk to you, so please uh, reach out to me or one of our elders, and we'd love to share the good news of the gospel to you. And um, I know that it's, it's hard. Evangelism's hard. I mean, we're learning this in our small group. It's not easy. It's challenging. And so that's why we have to rely on, on God and his strength, but also the support of one another, the encouragement of one another, the prayers of one another that can be a blessing and a source of encouragement for all of us to do that. All now, may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times in every way. May the Lord be with you all and all of God's people said, amen. Thank you. You are loved.